Hi. Okay, I'm just going to say a few things about the chapter that we read by Adrienne Rich called Anger and Tenderness from her book A Woman Born. <laughs> um, and really, I w assigned this reading as a kind of prompt for our own reflections at the start of the course to start thinking about gender and gender expression and um, the kind of concrete reality of the domestic labour that women are often expected to do uh, and its relationship to art making and art production. Um, we'll keep thinking about some of those things as we continue in the course. And so Rich gives us a, a nice example of someone um, kind of talking in a really concrete and personal way that I think can be helpful for, yeah, just prompting our own thoughts about um, our own experiences of gender. So that was the main reason why I signed it. And so I hope that you read, read the chapter. I think that reading Rich's own voice is probably more valuable than um, just like me going over the highlights, but I'm going to do that because <laughs> uh, there are certain things that um, I think are, I just want to pull out to make sure that we um, have them before us as we go, go forward. And at the end of this video, I will talk a little bit about what um, patriarchy means since she uses that term. It's going to come up in further readings and it can mean different things to different authors. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of the things that it can mean to give you a general sense of what someone might be thinking when they when they write that. Okay, so. Um, Right, Rich gives us a first-person account of the tension that can be experienced between the traditional role one might be expected to take on as a woman and mother and the role of an artist, in Rich's case, a poet. We can see this to pick one example in her observation that she stopped writing poetry when she came, became pregnant with her first son. It seemed appropriate to her at the time that having a baby should kind of take over her life, and she started reading magazines about motherhood and raising a child, um, rather than focusing on her own creative work. So I think it is nice to have a first personal account uh, because it's kind of one thing to be told that the domestic labour women have been expected to perform through history might have limited their ability to work as artists, and another thing to sort of grasp the reality of that. And um, right, so the quotation that I had in mind is just uh, this one. From the 50s and early 60s, I remember a cycle. It began when I picked up a book or began trying to write a letter, or even found myself on the pho telephone with someone toward whom my voice betrayed eagerness, a rush of sympathetic energy. The child or children might be absorbed in busyness, in his own dream world, but as soon as he felt me gliding into another world, which did not include him, he would come to pull at my hand, ask for help, punch at the typewriter keys, and I would feel his wants at such a moment as fraudulent as an attempt, moreover, to defraud me of living even for 15 minutes as myself." I've observed this kind of dynamic between parents and their children. I don't know if you have either, but it's like the child is playing just fine by themselves and then uh, you get there and they want to chat with you and suddenly the child's all over them. <laughs> it is it is a thing and it's something that Rich kind of points out might be um, sort of heightened or made more intense by the fact that in our current setup, our parents are often expected to look after children in something of an isolated bubble at home, at least for the first year or so, or maybe not if you go if um, somebody goes back to work. The person who is off on parental leave goes back earlier, but there's usually some stretch of time, and it's very nice in Canada that we do have support for that time, <laughs> um, where you are kind of on your own looking after the child, and that is a really intense period. Um, so those thoughts of hers are, are interesting that perhaps the, our present kind of system for looking after young children um, makes uh, the, the kind of mutual claim upon one another between parents and their children more intense or something like that. I don't know what you think, but it's, it's an interesting thought. Okay, so there are two ways that motherhood might be seen as in tension with artistic production. And the first one has to do with this. It's just the practical issue that the tasks of motherhood, cleaning, managing the home, um, working with little children close to you, that they might leave someone with little time and emotional energy to engage in art making. Statistics Canada tells us that women still spend more time than men on housework and child rearing, and within child rearing, women tend to spend more time than men on those kind of menial routine tasks of it, the constant feeding, cleaning, clothing, comforting, <laughs> carrying kind of stuff, rather than um, you know, helping with schoolwork or engaging in recreational activities with children, that kind of thing. 
The gap between men and women in terms of time spent on childcare per day has actually held steady since the mid-80s. Women also spend more of their leisure time than men multitasking, such as trying to do recreational activities like art making at the same time as they're also, say, looking after children. Um, right. I just, uh, in my notes, I was going to read the passage now, but I already read it, so, <laughs> okay. As we will see with Battersby, often through the history of thinking about artistic genius, explanations drawing upon uh, physiology and psychology were given to support the idea that women are not really capable of the same level of artistic genius as men. But sometimes the men reflecting on this question are more frank about the possible underlying motivations for such a view and simply say, well, it wouldn't be a good idea for women to have artistic ambitions because it would take them away from the necessary work that they do in the home and caring for children. This is an explicitly practical rationale for not encouraging women to pursue the arts. And the scale of that practical need is worth considering. Somebody has to raise children. Somehow that work has to be covered. Sometimes the people who do that work are paid for it if um, by those who are wealthy enough to hire help. But a great deal of that work has been done and is still done uh, by women without pay often without being considered real work at all, a sort of invisible, constant, ongoing labour. And while there is certainly a bodily reality to pregnancy and childbirth, if that's the way that a baby is fed, I want us to think for a moment about the way that our ideas about motherhood, in particular the expectation that women will do most of the grunt work even beyond the first year or two, is shaped by cultural forces, the stories and images we have of motherhood, the family traditions that go into it, that are shaped by our cultures, the social norms that we fear breaking because we know that others will judge us for it, going against the grain, or if we do go against the grain anyway, living with the tension and added friction of that in social life. Rich gives us a starting point for reflecting upon how all those things might be present in our lives even now. And then secondly, so I just raised the idea of motherhood as a kind of cultural idea or a norm, and then on this level too, we might think there is something some tension between motherhood and then having an identity as an artist. It might not just be the practical reality of trying to fulfill domestic duties and pursue art making that presents a challenge. Conceptually, we might think there is some kind of tension. Motherhood has been, and in some ways still is, thought of as the thing that should be most important in a woman's life. And I think it can still sometimes be seen as selfish, or experienced by the individual has, who has internalized this kind of attitude as selfish. Um, to maintain another identity independent from it, perhaps an identity related to one's career or artistic ambitions, as, as Rich describes. She certainly um, describes always feeling the way she talks in the chapter about um, having 15 minutes to, to be myself, or how she, just, she talks about how when people ask her why she doesn't write poetry about her children, um, she describes how she's always thought about her her um, poetic identity is being separate from that. Um, so it's interesting, it seems like there's a kind of a through line in Rich that continues to think of those two, th two things as being in some way incompatible. Even though I think she is critiquing that kind of separation, um, it still seems to be present in her, in her experience. Okay. So this is the next point that I wanted to bring out from the rich reading, and that is the question of what is it to be a woman? What does this role involve in terms of how to dress and move and what kind of thing you're into? Um, this is something else that Rich talks about in the chapter, and it could be a useful prompt for starting to reflect upon this ourselves and whether or not we've had similar experiences or, um, or not. She describes experiences both where she sort of finally feels like she's fitting seamlessly into this kind of age-old part of being a woman, and other experiences where she feels out of sync with this and like it doesn't fit her very well. I'm going to start with the former kind of experience and just quote her a little bit. Quote, I have a very clear, keen memory of myself the day after I was married. I was sweeping a floor. Probably the floor did not really need to be swept. Probably, I simply did not know what else to do with myself, but as I swept that floor, I thought, now I am a woman. 
This is the age-old action. This is what women have always done. I felt I was bending to some ancient form, too ancient to question. This is what women have always done. And she continues, As soon as I was visibly and clearly pregnant, I felt for the first time in my adolescent and adult life not guilty. The atmosphere of approval in which I was bathed, even by strangers on the street, it seemed, was like an aura I carried with me, in which doubts, fears, misgivings met with absolute denial. This is what women have always done. End quote. I want to linger for a moment with this kind of experience. You may have had moments like this in relation to gender. The thing that strikes me about Rich's description is that even when it is an experience of fulfilling one's gender, or kind of seamlessly fitting into some idea of an ancient pattern, that very feeling of, oh, now I'm doing it, now, now I'm, I'm in the role or whatever, as it washes over you, it reveals that that feeling is often absent. It's kind of against a background of not always feeling that you're seamlessly fitting into this role, that this kind of experience of relief and elation could be felt when you seem to be doing it right. Rich also describes feeling this feeling of being ill at ease in the gendered role that has been assigned to one. Quote, To be like other women had been a problem for me. From the age of 13 or 14, I had felt I was only acting the part of a feminine creature. At the age of 16, my fingers were almost constantly ink-stained. I'm going to break in here to notice how even here she offers proof of her writing, her ink-stained fingers, as being at odds with feeling feminine. This opposition between being an artist and being a woman is felt throughout Rich's chapter, as I was saying. Um, she's challenging that opposition, but it still kind of creeps up everywhere in her description of herself. Right, back to the Rich. The lipstick and high heels of the era were difficult to manage disguises. In 1945, I was writing poetry seriously and had a fantasy of going to post-war Europe as a journalist, sleeping among the ruins in bomb cities, recording the rebirth of a civilization after the fall of the Nazis. But also, like every other girl I knew, I spent hours trying to apply lipstick more adroitly, straightening the wandering seams of stockings, talking about boys. There were two different compartments already to my life. I felt that as an incipient real woman, I was a fake. Particularly was I paralyzed when I encountered young children. I think I felt men could be, or wished to be, conned into thinking I was truly feminine. A child I suspected could see through me like a shot. This sense of acting apart created a curious sense of guilt, even though it was a part demanded for survival." End quote. There are lots of things to pick up on in this passage. I just saw another one that I didn't mention previously, which is um, this just this idea that one's kind of f femininity or something would be sensed by children, like that, the connection between that and motherhood and caring for children is interesting. Um, or maybe I just noticed it because I've also always kind of felt the same way. <laughs> okay, uh, a few but a few reflections that I had prepared that were inspired by this passage. First, um, our gender expression is something we often receive feedback on in various ways from others, friends, family, strangers. Sometimes this feedback kind of focuses on technique, like applying lipstick well or, or something else, choosing the color or cut of clothing that's flattering, or performing how to perform some role that's expected you on the basis of your gender, um, related to different cultural traditions maybe. But usually there's kind of a difficult to pinpoint border where it becomes feedback on gender expression. Uh, perhaps that a, a certain style of shirt isn't one that a man should wear, or that a haircut is too short for a woman. And in those moments, we might consciously experience gender, as Rich does in this passage, as something to be done, a kind of actively reg an, an activity regulated by a set of kind of nebulous, never quite settled rules gleaned from the world around us. And so those rules can be subject to change and variation, given our social setting. It could be different in our originary family home than it is um, in a social setting we choose for ourselves, for instance. Sometimes we think of this activity as trying to express a certain sort of static fact of the matter about the gender we have or are. At other times, we might experience our active kind of doing of gender, as it were, to be itself shaping and forming our sense of what our gender is or means. I said above, the gender we have or are, and these different possibilities for how to put it, 
are themselves somewhat thought-provoking, suggesting the shifting ways we think about the relationship between gender and selfhood. Do I have a gender? In which case the I is suggested to be a substance to which this predicate attaches. Or am I a gender? My gender is part of the underlying subject itself. Is having a gender something that comes after selfhood and attaches to it? Or is having a gender a constitutive condition of selfhood? Judith Butler will reflect upon the ways that gender has been a crucial part of being socially viable as a person, a sort of social condition of selfhood in our culture, and we will think more about the puzzle of how to think about gender with her. Another thing Rich's chapter does is start us thinking outside the box in terms of one of the most entrenched ideas of gender roles we have, which is motherhood. Is the kind of often isolated, unpaid labour of women looking after children the only way that we could do this? Are there other possibilities? It's kind of a... Um, it's actually both exciting but hard to imagine a, a different way of doing it, but I think that's one one of the kind of interesting things of Rich's chapter. So Rich writes, quote, But it will be said, this is the human condition, this interpenetration of pain and pleasure, frustration and fulfillment. I might have told myself the same thing 15 or 18 years ago, but the patriarchal institution of motherhood is not the human condition any more than rape, prostitution and slavery are. Those who speak largely of the human condition are usually those most exempt from its oppressions, whether of sex, race, or servitude. Motherhood, unmentioned in the histories of conquest and serfdom, wars and treaties, exploration and imperialism, has a history, it has an ideology, it is more fundamental than tribalism or nationalism. My individual seemingly private pain as a mother, the individual seemingly private pains of the mothers around me and before me, whatever our class or colour, the regulation of women's reproduction, reproductive power by men in every totalitarian system and every socialist revolution, the legal and technical control by men of contraception, fertility, abortion, obstetrics, gynecology, and extrauterine reproductive experiments, all are essential to the patriarchal system, as is the negative or suspect status of women who are not mothers. End quote. All right, so a few things to note about this passage. Here we have the eye-opening idea that our ideas about motherhood might not be simply reflecting the natural way things are, but the practical reality of motherhood, the conditions under which this work is done and by whom and with what compensation or not, along with all of our cultural images and ideas of mother, mothers, that this is a kind of institution, an organization of resources and ideas that perpetuates a certain model of social life. And perhaps it could be different. That's the first important point, just to start thinking, oh, maybe it could be different. Although Rich does address the specific intersection of race and motherhood at times, we also see here a classic kind of thinking for this period of feminist writing, which was to push to, which was a push to realize that what was happening in one's private life was not just you, it was not just a personal problem, it was systemic. The urge here to talk about all women is strong, because it comes out of this powerful realization, well it's not just me, and you start thinking, as Rich does, aren't women the world over expected to bear the brunt of the housework? Aren't women the world over uh, under different political systems? Aren't they all supposed to place motherhood at the center of their lives and do most of the drudge work uh, in connected to it too? Isn't their contribution to society, to the revolution, etc., always the production of children first, not their ideas, their leadership in political life, their inventions, their creativity, their writing? Even as I say this, a different sort of feminist voice pops into my head saying, why think of producing children as a mere bodily matter that doesn't involve leadership, invention, creativity, even writing? And other and another feminist answers, maybe the, maybe the first feminist, yes, but motherhood applies all these things to a very small circle, the few children one has, and so it is still limiting, and for all the importance it is given, it is certainly not considered as important as the leadership, creativity, and inventions of men in public life. All right, but to return to the point I was making about this passage, one can understand the thrust of this discovery, that problems that seem private are really political and systemic, would lead to this kind of sort of sweeping claim that something about this problem applies to women everywhere. But it is just this kind of sweeping claim, offered by middle-class white women like Rich, that places a middle-class white perspective on those problems at the centre of feminism, presenting it as a description of every woman's situation, and ignoring the ways that differences of class and racialization are going to fundamentally change and shape our other women's experience of these issues. 
Mothering children, perhaps in particular, is so deeply and richly informed by our cultural inheritances, our family setting, our class. It isn't that we couldn't find any common ground, I think, across these differences, but that to address this aspect of life in a concrete way, as has to happen, this has to happen in a conversation that is capable of delving into and exploring those differences. In my view, Rich's lasting contribution in this area is really her descriptions of her own concrete and personal experience, one that might resonate or not with each of us in different ways, not offered as the basis for sweeping claims across history and around the world, but just her own, her own experience. Rich's experience cannot stand as an articulation of what all of us experience, but it is one voice, and it should be one voice among many. So I want us to think I've given us, Rich. <laughs> what are the voices that are meaningful to you about motherhood that help you to clarify what this role involves and how it is thought of in your life? Our own mothers or mother figures will loom large, and I suspect mine would have felt judged quite harshly by Rich, for she wanted to stay home with small children, although I don't expect it that she... She, uh, I don't think she expected to have so many. She already had a four and a three-year-old, and the third baby turned out to be twins, <laughs> which was me. I think we should also acknowledge that motherhood might not be terribly relevant to one's life. Well, Rich is critical of placing motherhood at the center of our idea of womanhood. To carry out that sort of criticism in a practical way, we need to be able to stop talking about it and focus on other things, in life and in feminism an attitude that is, in its own way, a bit radical against the backdrop of this history. And then the last thing that I wanted to pick up from this particular passage is the term patriarchy, as I was saying, because we're going to see it again many times, and it's worth just pausing to think about the various things that this could mean to give us kind of a general sense of it, um, and then what it's going to mean in, for particular authors, uh, you'd have to work it out given the way that they each use it. So a rough starting place for thinking about this is just the dictionary definition. I'm just going to go with the Google dictionary definition. So as a starting place, we can think of patriarchy as being a system of a society or government in which the father or eldest male is head of the family and descent is traced through the male line. Related to this, we could think of it as a system or of society or government in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. So those are already two slightly different ways of thinking about patriarchy. One of them highlights a system of inheritance, um, and the other one talks about a relation of power. To help us with this, I'm actually going to quote from Griselda Pollock and her paper Vision and Difference. This is a paper where she's talking about art history and feminist approaches to art history. Um, but in the course of that paper, she takes up this question, what do we mean by this word patriarchy? And she canvasses uh, a couple of different ways that feminists have used this word. So I'm just going to give us her, her um, reflections there. Okay, so Griselda Pollock, quote, There are several feminisms. Take, for instance, three quite distinct political definitions of patriarchy. A quote from Kate Millet's book, Sexual Politics, in 1971, will illustrate the idea that patriarchy is about the exclusive possession of instrumental social power. This is quoting Kate Millett. Our society is a patriarchy. The fact is evident at once if one recalls that the military, industry, technology, universities, science, political offices, finances, in short, every avenue of power within society, including the coercive force of the police, is in entirely male hands." End quote. In her article, The Unhappy Marriage of Marxism and Feminism, Heidi Hartman offers her contribution to the definition of patriarchy as a hierarchy of relations between men in order to dominate women. So this is quoting Heidi Hartman. We can usefully define patriarchy as a set of social relations between men, which have a material base and which, th though hierarchical, establish and create interdependence and solidarity among men that enable them to dominate women. Though patriarchy is hierarchical, and men of different classes, races, or ethnic groups have different places in the patriarchy, they are also united in the shared relationship of dominance over their women. They are dependent on each other to maintain that domination. The material base upon which patri patriarchy rests lies most fundamentally in men's control over women's labor power. Men maintain control by excluding women from access to some essential productive resources, 
in capitalist societies, for example, jobs that pay living wages, and by restricting women's sexuality. End quote. From Hartman. <laughs> We're back to Pollock. Hartman thus lays stress on the interrelationships between men across other social divisions which unite them in subordinating women. She also points to two crucial areas of its enactment, exclusion from equality in work and submission through sexuality. She usefully therefore reminds us that power is not just a matter of coercive force, but a network of relationships, of inclusions and exclusions, of domination and subordination. In recent years, another formulation has been advanced, which shifts the attention from sociologically defined sexual divisions in society, based on given gender categories, men and women, to the idea that sexual divisions are the result of the construction of sexual difference, a socially significant axis of meaning. Difference in English means a state of being unlike. The word distinction conveys the correct meaning more precisely. Distinction is a result of an act of differentiation, drawing distinctions, a process of definition of categories. Thus, masculinity and femininity are not terms which designate a given and separate entity, men and women, but are simply two terms of difference. In this sense, patriarchy does not refer to the static, oppressive domination by one sex over another, but to a web of psychosocial relationships which institute a socially significant difference on the axis of sex, which is so deeply located in our very sense of lived sexual identity that it appears to us as natural and unalterable. To oppose this powerful web, we have to develop a theory of how gender is actually produced, how sexuality is socially organized into the categories of masculinity and femininity, lived out through social positions as wives, mothers, daughters, fathers, sons, etc. These positions are produced initially in those social institutions around childcare and socialization, family relations, school, and the acquisition of language. But they have constantly to be reinforced by representations that are made to us in the range of ideological practices that we call culture. Pictures, photographs, films, etc. are addressed to us as their viewers and work upon us by means of winning our identification with those versions of masculinity and femininity which are presented to us. It is a process of constantly binding us into a particular, but always unstable, regime of sexual difference." End quote from Pollock. So we can see there, patriarchy can mean some, sometimes people will be using it to describe, um, let's see how does Pollock put it, to describe a sort of political system where um, women, say, are excluded from holding certain positions, um, from certain kinds of work or political positions, etc. So that's one, one idea of patriarchy, and probably a part of that one is the idea that um, inheritance goes through the male line. Um, yeah, <laughs> they seem somewhat historically like, connected. Um, but then in the back end of this quote, <laughs> in the back end of this quote, uh, we see a different idea of patriarchy emerging, which isn't so much about the social positions, social and political positions that are social, economic and political positions that are open to women or men. Um, but more of uh, talking about patri patriarchy as a way of thinking about gender and differentiating gender through all kinds of cultural mechanisms. And although Pollock doesn't include this, I think the idea of patri patriarchy involves the sense that one of those cultural terms, the masculine, is valued over the other, the feminine. So it might be that um, Patriarchy isn't just about sort of excluding women from, as I say, political, economic, and, pos and uh, social positions. Perhaps those things could be remedied. Perhaps more jobs could be opened to women, as, as happened in the 80s, and political positions of power, etc. Um, but we might still talk about a kind of cultural patriarchy where, in our culture, representations of masculinity and femininity have, um, are differently valued. And just the way that those categories are constructed through um, cultural means. So, writers could be using patriarchy, patriarchy to talk about a kind of political 
um, economic and social organization that excludes certain people from certain positions. That's, that's one part of it. But they could also be talking about this kind of cultural production of genders and um, that are valued differently and positioned differently. Okay. I'm going to include, I'm going to put up the text of Griselda Pollock's quotation because I find it helpful um, on the Quirkus page for this, underneath this video, so you can look at it for yourself. Okay, so these reflections on Rich are somewhat preliminary, and if you, um, you know, if you disagree with the things that I'm saying, I would like to hear about it. I think this is all, this is all up for discussion. This, I wanted it to be a prompt for further thought and discussion. Um, so I would, I would welcome, welcome your thoughts if you'd like to share on the Discord channel. Some people already have, which is amazing. Um, or if you would like to uh, chat in person, I will be there tomorrow on Friday from 11 to 12 in our Blackboard Collaborate course room. Um, yeah, I'd love to, to know what you thought about this, about this reading.